Even if you consider yourself hopeless with gardening, you'll most likely have come across an orchid before. These beautiful alien-like flowers are perfect for any occasion. Housewarming gift? Orchid. Mother's Day? Orchid. Done something awkward? Give them an orchid. They really are the most versatile plant, but there's so much more to what makes them one of the world's most interesting and most important species of plants. The Orchidaceae family is one of the world's two largest families of flowering plants. There are around 25,000 different species of orchids and they grow pretty much everywhere, from rainforests to mountaintops on every continent, except Antarctica. And each of these species is completely different from the next. Some species live to 100 years old, while the smallest variety only ever reaches two millimetres tall. There's even one species commonly known as the warty hammer orchid that uses sexual mimicry to trick a type of male wasp into mating with them in order to pollinate themselves. Sounds weird? Well, Australia is the home of sexually deceptive plants. Oh, yeah. These quirks make orchids all the more interesting, but they're also fundamental to life on Earth. Think of them as the canaries of our ecosystem. Just as a dead canary warned miners of imminent danger, diminishing orchid populations warned scientists of imminent degradation of an entire ecosystem. This is why it's such a massive problem. So many of our native orchid species are under threat. But what exactly is threatening them? To find out, I had a chat with Jessica Waite from the Australian Institute of Botanical Science. So Jess, we know that orchids are under a lot of threat, but what are some of those main pressures that they face? Orchids face a number of direct and indirect threats. The direct threats could be bushfires, for example. We've also got grazing pressures from livestock, but also from native animals. Land clearing and habitat removal and indirect threats is anything uh, that happens to affect their pollinators. So a lot of the orchids have very specific pollinator requirements. Is there something else orchids need in particular? Orchids have tiny little seeds. I'm not sure if you can see it very well in here, but we have the seed capsules. And when each of these capsules split, there's up to 20,000 seeds per capsule. So they're dust-like. This gives them the advantage of being able to spread across a wide landscape. But the disadvantage is that these tiny seeds have virtually no reserves in which to germinate. And they require the penetration of a mycorrhizal fungi in the very early stage of germination to provide that seed the nutrients in which to germinate. There are over 1,700 different orchid species in Australia and about 500 in New South Wales alone. But what are we doing about it? Scientists at the Australian Institute of Botanical Science are working on a number of ways to preserve our native orchid species. And the first step is seed collection. To get an insight into the fascinating task of seed collecting, I had a chat to Gavin Phillips from the Australian Institute of Botanical Science. So you're a seed collector. What exactly does that job entail? In essence, it's what it sounds like. I go out into the bush and I find seeds mostly in New South Wales. And there's one species in particular of orchid, the Talong Midge orchid that you've worked on. Can you just tell us what it kind of looks like and a little bit more about it? So the Talong Midge orchid's a critically endangered orchid. It's very small, really small plant. The flowers themselves are probably five, seven millimetres across. The whole flower spike might be up to 20 centimetres tall, but when you've only got five or six flowers on a spike, they're really small. And when they're down amongst the bushes, they really don't stand out. Right, so if the flowers are super tiny, how do you even collect something like that? So for the orchids, if we're going to do a really comprehensive collection, we might do some hand pollinating first, where we go in, we'll hand pollinate the flowers. Once we've done that, if we don't interfere, the pods naturally split and they'll ripen up, they'll go green, and as they turn brown, they'll naturally open up and allow the wind to then blow the really light seeds out. For us, we don't want that to happen if we're doing the seed collection. So after the hand pollination or if we come early on, we might bag those seeds in something like a tea bag or very fine mesh bags in order to capture those so the wind doesn't take them away from us. We'll go away, we'll come back after a set time and then we'll be able to get the seeds once they've matured. And the seeds, you know, with orchids, you can get lots out of a single pod. So we get pretty good bang for our buck. And have you had any success with these seeds? You know, they've been brought back to plant bank, but you know, what's happened to them after? 
So we have had success storing the seeds of the Talongmi orchid here at the Australian Plant Bank. We've got multiple collections from different populations which give us an insurance policy so if something happens to the wild populations, we might be able to do something about that in the future. But it's not just pollination and seed collection that is a fine art. Orchids also depend on certain mycorrhizal fungi for their survival. So along with collecting seeds, researchers also have to collect soil and fresh plant matter where the mycorrhizal fungi live and bring it back to the lab. So what projects are you and the team working on to help save some of our most threatened orchids in Australia? So we are working with the New South Wales Government Saving Our Species program. We've been given eight very rare, very endangered species to work on to try and basically germinate them in the lab in the hope that if something does happen to their wild populations, we'll be able to translocate these individuals back into the wild so that they can persist into the future. What's involved in that day-to-day -day lab work? You know, what, what does it look like? We really need to be able to store the seeds alongside their mycorrhizal fungi partners. Otherwise, we just cannot germinate the seeds. We try and extract the fungi from living tissue of the orchid, so the roots, the collar of the plant and the tuber, but we also are trying to do this thing called seed baiting. And I don't know if you can see here, but we've got some site soil, which has been collected from about a 10 centimetre radius of the plant in the hope that this soil has the mycorrhizal fungi that we need to grow the seeds. We've then put some filter paper on top and spread some of the seeds on top of the filter paper. And we're hoping that that fungi that may exist in that soil may be able to penetrate the seeds and form what we call a protocorm and then we can extract the fungi directly from the protocorm. Once the team has finished the lengthy process of baiting and growing the fungi, it's time to plant baby orchids on the fungi to see if they take. Growing orchids in a lab isn't all that's needed to protect these incredible plants. You see, they've also got to be pollinated. And for some species that can happen pretty easily, but for those that rely on certain insects, the rates of successful pollination are much lower. This is because insect populations around the world are declining, not only in numbers, but in overall diversity. And like we heard from Jessica Waite, some plants have a specific monogamous relationship with their pollinator. And in that instance, they've got to be hand pollinated. And that means using teeny tiny tools like a toothpick. You mentioned hand pollination. Can you explain sort of step by step what you actually have to do? Yeah, so with the hand pollination, because we're trying to get maximum genetic diversity, we want to cross pollinate those flowers. So that involves getting a toothpick, getting the pollen from one flower, taking that to another flower and applying that to the stigmatic surface in that next flower, ensuring that we get a diversity. And we might do that between multiple plants across a site and that can take a considerably long time when we're dealing with very small flowers like on some orchids. So that's what goes into keeping orchids and by extension, our ecosystems alive and well. Now you might be thinking these plants are high maintenance, but a plant as interesting and as important as an orchid is well worth maintaining. An easier way for you to help protect orchids is to support the work of the Australian Institute of Botanical Science with a donation. Fight for our flora and make an impact. Go to botanicgardens.org.au slash donate to help protect our plants and our future.